So I've been, over the last six years or so since I've been here, meeting with a leadership coach on and off who's been encouraging me, helping me to think through how do we, how do, we do church and how do we reach our community. Um, really love Dave. He's a, he's a, a has a long, uh, long lifetime of, of serving in some really crazy, uh, amazing churches around the country and in, our, in the Vancouver area here. And he always has really hard questions for me, but really good questions. Um, one of the things we talked about a couple of weeks ago was this. He said, you got to figure out what's the good news for this generation. Now, you might think, well, we know what the good news is. It's obvious. It's the same good news that it always has been. You get to go to heaven. That's the good news. Well, actually, the good news needs to back up a little bit, right? I mean, according to the Apostle Paul, the good news, the gospel, the best news of all, is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, gave his life. He died. He was buried and was resurrected on the third day, defeating sin and death and hell forever. Like, that's the good news. Jesus died, was raised again. And as a result of that, the benefit of that is that our sins are forgiven, we're made right with God, and we get the blessing of eternal life, which includes heaven after we die. That's the good news. And it is good news. It is great news. It is life-transforming news. And, and, and for every generation, for every generation... There's also even more good news. Because God's good news doesn't end, right, with just what we want to put in the so-called spiritual box. God is King of kings, Lord of lords of every part of our life of the whole world. And so there's good news for every part of our lives. And every generation has recognized specifically that there's good news for their generation. The builders who experienced the devastation and pain of the Great Depression. You heard your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents' stories, right? For the builder generation, that included the good news of freedom from guilt. For the boomer generation, the baby boomers who, who were born in that area of expansion and of, of economic expansion, post-World War II growth, it included the good news that God has blessings and wants to bless. And it's interesting that the themes of God's blessing in every area of life and even prosperity came along with growth and prosperity that was happening in the broader culture, right? But that was a part of the good news. Now, some preachers, unfortunately, took that message of prosperity too far. But the fact that it took it too far means that there was something in it that if it wasn't taken too far, is still true and that God blesses. And so now, what's the, what's the good news for, for our generation? We, we Gen Xers, we're, we're trying to figure it out. We're like the middle child of generations that's constantly forgotten and overlooked, and so we kind of looked at each side of us, but um, try not to be bitter about that. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, 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 won't, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> As I've been thinking, praying, and thinking and praying ever since that conversation led me to just a couple of, couple of things. This is not specifically what we're going to talk about today, but it kind of leads into it. That I think that in this current moment, part of what the good news of Jesus also means, in addition to our sins are forgiven, peace with God in heaven, includes that and includes a message of good news about our identity. And that we can have healthy, thriving sense of identity through Jesus. I think the good news includes, in this generation, in this moment, a sense of healthy community. And that we're not alone in life. And, in this generation, the good news includes a message that in Christ we really can experience peace of mind and heart and emotions and that we can rest even when our bodies, minds, and emotions seem to be just a storm of confusion, that we can rest easy in Jesus. That Jesus doesn't always take away our anxiety, but he gives us this odd peace in the middle of it. So for the next few weeks, 
what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation about what does it look like for us Jesus followers to share good news with our generation in our communities, in our places. But I realize that before, before we have that conversation, we need to hear some good news all over again. Because here's what I'm hearing, and here's what I'm sensing, that everyone, followers of Jesus and not yet followers of Jesus, healthy, stable folks and folks in a place of insecurity, that everyone is struggling, that everyone is exhausted. Having a conversation with Randy, our children's pastor, he's in conversation with a lot of our families, and he said, man, the conversations I'm having, he's like, everyone is struggling. And it feels like most of us feel like we're just hanging on by a thread. We're hanging on by a thread, and then we read our news feed, and it just seems like every institution, every news story, every country, every current event is one fire after another, and it feels like we just look around and the whole world's on fire, and we're just hanging on by a thread. God says to us, Hear my truth. So if you want to read along in your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of Hebrews today. Um, book of Hebrews is a really interesting book. Um, if you were to read through the Bible and try to understand the whole kind of scope of the Bible, here's what I'd recommend. You start in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus, and get the core, most important information that you can get about God. Then finish off the New Testament and read about what it means to follow Jesus. Then you go back and you read the prequel, which we call the Old Testament, and then from there, if that doesn't thoroughly confuse you, then you go to the book of Hebrews, which helps to kind of bring the two of them together. You see, um, the book of Hebrews was written to a group of people who were raised Jewish. And so they knew their Bible, they knew their Old Testament, they knew more than just the Ten Commandments, but they knew a lot of the laws, a lot of the traditions. They had grown up going to the temple to offer sacrifices for their sins. They had grown up going to their local synagogue, praying the prayers that we find in the Psalms. They had grown up observing the, the religious festivals and the feasts that we find in the Old Testament, and they were faithful. Somewhere along the way, they heard about Jesus, this Jewish rabbi who also claimed to be the Son of God, and rather than reject him, they came to accept him. They found the forgiveness of their sins. But what came along with that was many of them were persecuted, even from within their family and their Jewish community. They were kicked out of their synagogues. They lost some business deals and contracts because they kind of helped each other in their Jewish community. And if you're going to follow Jesus, you're no longer one of us. And they paid a high price. And they were struggling. They're still continuing to struggle. And the theme in the book of Hebrews is this, is to say, don't forget. Don't forget how Jesus is the perfect way. Jesus is the only perfect one. Therefore, everything before Jesus is imperfect. The Old Testament represents an imperfect system of worshiping God and getting close to God. It's not bad. We don't want to discount it. But because it was before Jesus, it was by default imperfect. The, 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 the animals that would offer up to the sacrifice, uh, for sacrifice, they, 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 they were just... They were just a, an object lesson pointing to Jesus. Therefore, their sacrifice was imperfect. Therefore, it had to happen year after year after year after year where Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Therefore, he was a once and for all sacrifice. The priests who offered the sacrifices, they themselves were sinners who were imperfect and they had to offer a sacrifice for themselves before they could offer a sacrifice for anybody else. But Jesus was the perfect high priest who offered himself as a sacrifice. And he was perfect. Jesus is perfect. Everything before him was imperfect. And there's the story that, 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 that folks had heard about in the temple in Jerusalem. At the back room, the holiest of holies, there was a large curtain in front of it. And that once a year, the priest would take part of the sacrifice and go back behind the curtain. But he would go back with fear and trembling because he was going to get as close to God as a human could get on earth. And just in case he hadn't done the sacrifices right, hadn't prayed the prayers exactly, and there was some imperfection left in him that God wouldn't handle and he might be struck dead, he went behind that curtain with fear and trembling. Jesus dies on the cross. There's a earthquake in Jerusalem and that curtain is split in two and broken open symbolically saying access to God is now open and available to everyone through Jesus Christ who is perfect. Pick it up in uh, Hebrews chapter 10 starting at verse 19. Therefore brothers and sisters here's what this means for us in very practical terms of our faith. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, So in other words, now we can have confidence. We don't have to go with fear and trembling, wondering if something's going to happen, something bad's going to happen to us. Through Jesus, we have confidence. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Jesus, the perfect high priest, let's draw near to God with a sincere heart, with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. There's all kinds of this symbolism from the Old Testament that he brings into the New, that he says our sins are forgiven and gone for good. We can have confidence with Jesus. Therefore, let's make the most of this confidence and let's run to Jesus with confidence. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the faith that we, let's let's hold unswervingly Swervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And based on the faithfulness of Jesus, we can be faithful, we can be bold, we can be confident. We can have confidence before God. We don't have to live in fear. That was the old imperfect system. And think about this, okay? If I can have confidence before God, and if I can stand before God, not arrogantly, but confidently because of Jesus. I gain a sense of identity wherever I'm confident. Could it be that one of the reasons we're experiencing and living with so much anxiety So we heard a message, and we've been told a message for years, maybe that originated from those builders in the builder generation who lived with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame that wasn't as motivating as people had hoped it would be. And they said, I don't want my kids my grandkids to live with guilt and shame. I want them to live with confidence. And so we've been told for years that we should have self-confidence. And when we don't feel confident... We don't feel a lot of self-confidence. We're told to fake it until we make it. And I wonder if so much of our anxiety is because we're worn out from faking it and we're afraid we might never make it. And I don't want to be too harsh on all those messages, right? Because it's just just not going to be helpful. But Jesus says, I've got a better way. You don't have to be self-confident. You can be confident in me, son of God who provided the way for you to go and stand before God. And I reach out my hand to you, and if you take my hand, Jesus says, I'll lead you to God, and together we will stand before God. I'll defend you before God. By the way, I am God when you're holding my hand. You're holding the hand of God. Let's go to God confidently in Christ with Christ. And when you have that confidence in Jesus, you begin to have a sense of identity. And you look in the mirror and you say, who am I? Jesus is holding my hand. That's who I am. I am a son or daughter of God. Jesus calls me even his friend. Confidence, identity. Verse 24, and let's consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as we see the day approaching, as life gets harder and harder and harder, he says, don't give in to the temptation to just stay home and hide out, feeling whatever you might kind of be feeling, but let's not give up the habit, the habit, the regular occurrence of meeting together. Church, thank you for coming to church today. Thank you for joining today. Thank you for being here today. I hope you're already glad you came. Coming to church a lot is a lot like going to the gym. You wake up and you don't feel like going, but when you go home, you're always glad that you did, right? And so we go to church and we gather, and you know what? Maybe you're not here just for you today. Maybe you're here today because somebody needs the words you have to say to them today. 
Maybe somebody today needs to be spurred on towards love because they've been trying to show love and they're getting worn out and discouraged and they've been hurt and they need somebody to encourage them and gently spur them on to love and to good deeds. And they're going to go home today saying, I'm going to keep on going, not because of what the pastor said, but because of what somebody who cares about them said, looked them in the eye, hugged them, encouraged them, whatever it may look like today. That's why we need community. And he says, keep on going. Verse 32 He says, remember those earlier days when you had received the light, when you gave your life to Jesus, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes, and this is what his his audience he's writing to, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison, and you joyfully accepted even the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming, he who is coming, he will come and he will not delay. Even though we may think that we don't need the good news of heaven as much because we're struggling here on earth. It's still good news that says, hey, even if we have to struggle for decades now, we're going to enjoy an eternity of decades with Jesus in a short little while. And so hang in there, persevere, encourage each other. We're going to see Jesus face to face very, very soon. Then he goes on and he lists in chapter 11 a whole list of Bible characters that, and stories that they had heard and stories that we've read about in the Old Testament. You should read through it. Hebrews chapter 11. It's really, really great. And then go back and like, read the original stories from the Old Testament. He says, all these folks, they were heroes of the faith because they trusted God even though they didn't see him. And though, though the greatest benefits of trusting in God were going to happen after the end of their life, but they still trusted God. They continued on and so should we. Then he gets into verse 12 and he says, I mean chapter 12, and, and uh, he says, one more, one more example from this old, imperfect system. Start at verse 18. He says, you and I, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm. You've not come to a mountain with a trumpet blast or such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. Even if an animal touches the, the mountain, it must be stoned to death. That sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. And, and well, maybe we might not remember the story, but his audience here remembered the story that after God had gone into Egypt and he takes his people out and he rescues them before they go to the promised land and they get their land to go off and do their own thing. He brings them together. And he says at the base of Mount Sinai, God comes down. Moses goes up to the top of the mountain. God comes down from heaven. There's lightning, there's smoke, there's earthquakes. It's crazy. It's scary. He's like, I'm God. I want you to take me seriously. And that is when he gives Moses the Ten Commandments and the laws. And this is how I want you to live for me, right? But it was, it was, there was a lot of fear because it was the old imperfect system before Jesus. And they stood at the mountain and even Moses said, this is overwhelming me. And they were like, we don't want to stand at the base of the mountain. We just kind of want to like we're so overwhelmed with fear, we just want to run away. And here we read, he says, you, we, we haven't. Fathers of Jesus, Jesus is perfect. We don't go to that kind of a mountain where we're like scared to death to even be there. No, no, no. Verse 22, you have come to a new mountain, Mount Zion. It's not just a desolate mountain. It is a city. You've come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. The church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Your name is in a book in heaven, the book of life. And it's Jesus' book. You're one of his. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, You've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkling of blood that speaks a better word even than the blood of Abel. Another, again, a whole bunch of Old Testament references there. But he says, you've come to a better city. The city of God. Angels in worship. 
It's not a place of fear. It's not a place you want to run away from because you're so scared. It's a place you want to run to. And then verse 25, he says, See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. I know it's easy for us to assume that it's like, don't refuse when God speaks a word that might be uncomfortable or confronts us a little bit or hard to hear. But it also includes, don't refuse and be so busy and distracted that you miss out when God speaks a word of encouragement or confidence. Sometimes the truth is hard to hear, but a lot of times the truth is really good to hear and helpful and encouraging. If we'll just slow down long enough to listen and trust and believe that this crazy message that sounds too good to be true is actually true because it's the God of the universe who speaks it. Go down to verse 26. He says, at that time, look into the past a little bit, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Okay, here's the word of truth. Don't miss this, he says. Now he, God has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken that is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. He says, there will be a shaking. I don't know if he is referring to like end times right before Jesus comes, the end of the end. <clears throat> I don't know if we're living in the days and months right before Jesus comes or if he's going to come another 300 years from now. I, I don't know. But let's not miss out what he says. Because part of it is when we read history and news, we recognize that there's just regular rumblings and shakings. And I've never lived in California long enough or visited long enough to experience an earthquake. Don't really want to. But I do live on the west side of I-5, and so when the big one comes, you're not going to see me again. I'm one of the ones that's getting wet, that's what they say. I should have moved to East Ridgefield, then I'd be safe. But there are regular shakings and when things start to shake we wonder if we're going to survive and it's stressful and it causes anxiety and fear and uncertainty but look what he says verse 28 therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let's be thankful Let's worship God acceptably with reverence and with awe. Don't miss the first part about that. He just assumes. He's like, don't forget, we followers of Jesus, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. When you're a follower of Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God cannot be shaken everything, when, even when everything else is shaking around you. The kingdom of God cannot be burned down to the ground even when everything else is on fire. The kingdom of God can live in peace and calm even when everything else around you is going crazy. And when you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, you don't have to listen to the message that you feel like you're hanging on by a thread. Because let me tell you, if you're hanging on by a thread, that thread is the strong and powerful hand of Jesus who is holding you tight. You are standing firm on a firm foundation of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. And we are citizens of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That is the truth we need to believe, hear it, adopt it, repeat it again and again and again until we believe it with every bit of our heart and it drowns out every other message of fear and uncertainty. So this week I came across a quote that has, in a good way, shaken, no, affirmed, encouraged, and given me some footing added a few more, a whole lot more threads to remind me I'm not hanging on by a thread. 
And I hope today we'll remind you and encourage you and affirm you that in Christ, you're not hanging on by a thread. That's just all the messaging around you. You're standing on the firm foundation of Christ. Look, look at this. I saw it this week, and it has just radically changed my thought process. Here's the first line. It goes like this. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. God's not working against me. God's working for me because I am his. And because I've trusted in Jesus, because of his great and wonderful and amazing grace, he has come to live in my life, and I am one in whom Christ dwells, and he even delights in me. He doesn't forgive me just because he has to. He forgives me because he wants to, and he loves me, and he lives in here. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. What would it look like for you to claim this truth today in Jesus? Maybe if you came to church today, and you're like, this is exactly what I need to hear, but I, I'm still running far from God. Maybe today is the day to stop running, to turn around and say yes to the God who's been chasing you down. You don't have to take three steps towards him. He's already there right behind you. All you got to do is turn and take his hand and say, Jesus, my life is yours. Come into my life. Clean me up. Forgive me. Lead me. Give me a sense of identity that's strong and firm in you, Jesus. If that's you today, Maybe you just stop listening right now so you can start talking to God. Because this is where it begins. This is in the end where it ends. This is the best news of the good news. We can claim it in Christ. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. And then we don't stop there. I live in the strong and unshakable kingdom of God. Everything might burn down around me, but I live in the strong kingdom of God. Everything around me might be shaking, but I live in the unshakable kingdom of God. And so, as a result, look at this last line. Come on, just read it with me. Here we go. The kingdom is not in trouble, and neither am I. God is not full of anxiety, worrying that the whole thing might burn down around him. The kingdom's not in trouble. And I'm a citizen of the kingdom, and as you as a follower of Jesus, you're a citizen of the kingdom. And so if the kingdom's not in trouble, the king's not in trouble, neither are you. There's just a lot of loud voices that would love to get you to buy into a lie that you're in trouble, to distract you and keep you from this great truth that is such good news for us today. How about we read all three lines together? Come on, read it with me. Here we go. I am one in whom Christ dwells and delights. I live in the strong and unshakable kingdom of God. The kingdom is not in trouble, and neither am I. What part of that do you really connect with? Because I hear it, you're connecting with it. Just think for a moment. Which line, which phrase is like, yes, yes, and yes, I needed to hear that today, and I'm probably going to need it to hear it tomorrow and the whole rest of the week. Which part of that do you connect with? Let's, let's bow our heads real quick and just have a time where we talk to God. Worship team, you guys can come on back. And you just talk to God right now about how you're hearing some really, really good news that you really need to hear today. And you might struggle to believe it, but it's time to say, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it. God, we believe. We're yours. You dwell in us. Your kingdom is strong. And we're so great, so, so glad to be citizens of your kingdom. Jesus, I pray today, would you remind us this week, would you remind us, Jesus, this week, I pray that your truth would drown out every distracting, untrue message that would keep us from your truth, that in you we're okay and we're strong, that your kingdom is not in trouble and neither are we. God, fill us with your truth. Strengthen us with your truth. Help us to stand on your truth this week, Lord Jesus.